keys, drum ons, keels, snakes, buses, palingers, nerves, hogs and conks. Although it's not always easy to know exactly what these vessels look like, it's clear that they fell into two main categories, sailing ships and multi-oared galleys, which could also hoist a sail when necessary. The former were the most numerous in English waters, so galleys were likely to belong to foreigners, very possibly pirates or enemy raiders. French and Genoese galleys capably of removing a flat can't or havoc among the south coasts. Galleys were essentially Mediterranean craft, ill-equipped for the bettering of battering of rougher northern seas, and the comparatively few English galleys were exclusively warships. They were propelled by up to 140 double-banked oars and shipyard accounts list expensive German boards and Scots furs. English oaks for main timbers. 24 Norfolk women each paid 2D a day, spent a fortnight stitching a galleys unwieldy single sail. Most English ships, however, searched as merchantmen in peacetime and were hired or commanded by the Crown for war. Single masted, they looked very much like Viking longships, except for the raised castles at bow and stern. These battlemented and brightly painted platforms protected archers and crossbowmen and may have only been attached in wartime. But uh, even peaceful trading was hazardous and they were probably permanent fixtures. Uh, ships like these were called keels, or echoing their Viking origin, snakes, and in the Viking tradition were steered by a large paddle, projecting the, protecting them from the right hand or starboard side of the ship, which therefore docked on the left or port side. During the early 14th century, keels were gradually uh, replaced by cogs that were probably developed by their straight slanting bows and central stern post rudder. Their deeper draft gave them greater carrying capacity, and uh, their flattened sides made them easily defensible to, to borders. The loftier castles gave their fighting men a vital height advantage over lesser craft. Cogs were the dominant warships and favoured merchantmen of the 14th century. In 1340, Edward directed the English naval victory at Sluys from his great Cog Thomas. It's quite a funny name, isn't it? Cog Thomas. Almost sounds like a euphemism. Taxes for axes. But we've got a little bit here, first of all, uh, from a chronicle. Let's, let's have a look at it. So, we've got the French sailors wishing to return to their ships. People from the neighbouring countryside or from the town killed many of them. The rest, abandoning what they had seized, returned to their ships in great confusion. On about the 29th of August, men from France came to Winchelsea with 700 ships and 50 galleys and tried to enter the port. It just so happened that at that time there were part 80 ships from Yarmouth and the neighbouring regions, and when they saw these, the French, stricken by fear, did not dare enter the port. Those from Yarmouth, together with their allies, embarked on their ships and galleys and launched a fierce attack on the French ships, causing them to sail away and retreat. But when they pursued the French over the sea, the French, observing the small size of the English fleet, dropped anchor and waited for them. The English, seeing this, did not dare proceed, but on the following night entered the port of Sandwich. In the same year, King Edward I ordered by writ that no one was to take duck eggs. The king sent instruction to all his sheriffs, ordering that they should make inquiries concerning all those who had land worth forty pounds or more, and to warn such men to be prepared when they should receive orders from the king to accompany him on his expedition to Gascony for three weeks. On the Sunday, 27th of November, the prelates, earls and barons, the proctors of the clergy and agents representing religious communities, gathered together, and the king asked them for subsidy to finance the war. At first he met with resistance, but after a few days the lady granted an eleventh of their goods. The royal towns, boroughs and ancient domains of the king conceded a seventh part. The prelates and clergy, however, resisted for many days, despite the threats, weariness and many expenses that they sustained while staying in London. At length, giving in, they conceded tenth part of their goods. It's quite a negotiation, really, that leads on to um, what we're looking at here as taxes for axes. Now, up here, Edward, um, lovely illustration, was waging war on many fronts and getting desperate for money. 
and wall traders were the worst affected by his maldot. So during the 1290s, the general confidence of the first two decades of Edward's reign was replaced by an atmosphere of uncertainty and tension. War with Scotland broke out in 1296, but the king's major problems arose from his efforts to retain Gascony, the last substantial remaining portion of the Plantagenet's continental lands against the predatory attentions of Philip IV of France. As the Duke of Aquitaine, Edward held Gascony since 1254 and paid an extended visit there from 1286 to 1289. And a war erupted between England and Norman sailors in 1293, during which Edward temporarily handed Gascony over to Philip. The King of France used his position as overlord to confiscate the duchy, and in response, Edward sent forces to Gascony and organised a coalition of allies. Uh, to the Low Countries and Germany, paying them to attack the French from the north. The fighting in Gascony was inconclusive, um, and Edward sent an expedition to Flanders to help his allies. Um, the English barons, led by the Earls of Norfolk and Hereford, the Marshal and Constable of England, refused to take part despite royal threats, and the King dismissed them from their offices. He also tried to force all men with an income of £20 a year or over to serve in his army. That's interesting, isn't it? You would think that people who were then earning such a larger amount of money for their time, they would want to do anything but go overseas and risk their lives in a war. I mean, it's uh, probably similar to today. If you're wealthy, you want to hold on to that wealth and you want to enjoy it. Why would I want to to go overseas and risk, risk my life? So unsurprisingly unsuccessful in this attempt, he was able to take um, only a small force consisting largely of his household knights to Flanders. By 1297, the strain of paying for the war with Gascony through taxation and other levies had aroused opposition, not only from the barons. Up until 1294, the taxes on lay subjects, the subsidies levied with the assent of Parliament, had been collected only occasionally, and there were three in the first 20 years of Edward's reign. From 1294 to 1297, there was a new one each year. The clergy had also been heavily taxed, often under protest. During this period, and in 1296, their opposition was stiffened when Pope Boniface VIII forbade churchmen to pay taxes to the king. Led by Robert Wynne Chelsea, Archbishop of Canterbury, they refused to pay a new levy in 1297, until virtually forced to do so when the king withdrew his protection and impounded their property. The population at large was severely affected during the war years when the scope of the king's right of prize, which had enabled him to requisition supplies for his household, was extended to supply his entire army. In theory, goods were paid for, but in practice, official corruption or lack of ready cash often meant that no payment was made. War merchants, and indirectly the war producers, were suffering from maltot, an export tax of 40 shillings per sack of wool. It had been imposed in 1294 and was still in force in 1297, when the king twice um, seized wool from the uh, producers without payment to sell for cash. And as a result of all these royal exactions, there was widespread anger and discontent throughout the land. The king needed desperately to obtain his people's consent for financing his war. The defeat of the English by the Scots at Stirling Bridge in September 1297 reunited Edward and his subjects, led to an agreement between the opposition led by Norfolk and Hereford and the King's ministers. The confirmation of the charters, confirming Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, which regulated forest laws and customs in a separate but associated document, the Crown concluded that in future, subsidies and privies would not be taken without agreement, and that the maltote would be abolished. He agreed to the concessions, and in 1298, sent justices around the country to inquire into administrative malpractices during the period of war, a token of good faith. It's so difficult, isn't it, to think that people could just knock on your door and take money away from you and take your livelihood away just for fighting other wars. I mean, I know that we can complain about taxes or the way in which our lives are um, managed or controlled administratively by our respective governments, but very different experience in the Middle Ages, isn't it? Here we have a uh, chronicle here of Walter of Gisborough describing an additional problem that King Edward I faced, the gradual worsening of relations between the English and the Scots. 
Scots were restless, um, fickle and unstable people, started a rebellion against the King of England, believing that they might throw off the yoke of servitude. The King of England sent letters to John Balliol, King of Scotland, asking him to send a proportion of the finest part of his army to fight in Edward's war against France. But the Scots, having entered into a treaty with Philip IV of France, raised their horns and prepared for battle. They said that neither their king nor they themselves were in any way bound to the King of England, that they had no obligation to obey his wishes or commands. Edward I then invaded Scotland and captured Berwick upon Tweed. Earl Warren inflicted a severe defeat on the Scots at Dunbar. So 1296, the initiative and morale of the Scots were weakened by the English victory at Dunbar, and after several days the King of England went to the castle of Roxburgh. The steward of Scotland had held it for a long time, but when Edward I arrived he surrendered it at once, on condition of safety in life and limb, lands and chattels. 15,000 Welshmen joined the king there, and he quickly sent back to England about the same number of worn-out English soldiers. After strengthening the castle at Roxburgh, Edward I set out with his whole army towards the Castle of the Maidens, which in English is called Edinburgh. He besieged it for eight days, and assaulted it heavily by using wooden siege engines that had brought, been brought there in large numbers. The garrison surrendered and were granted their lives. The King of Lincoln then went on to Stirling and found the castle there empty, with no one to resist him, for the garrison had fled in fear. Afterwards, King Edward I set out towards Perth, where on the 24th of June he created new knights amid great solemnity. He stayed there for several days, and messengers came to him there on behalf of the King of Scotland, asking for peace, a thing from which only recently King John had shrunk. After various negotiations and discussions, peace was made on the following terms. The King of Scotland was to resign his kingdom. He and his nobles were to surrender themselves to the will of the King of England with no limiting conditions. The Scots carried this out and surrendered themselves to the King of England. King John himself gave his son, Edward Balliol, as a hostage and renounced the Kingdom of England. I bet uh, John was, um, Edward Balliol was happy with that. Edward I returned to Berwick upon Tweed by way of Scone, and gave orders that the stone on which the kings of Scotland used to be enthroned, or their equivalent of coronation, should be removed and transported to London as a sign that the kingdom had been renounced and conquered. Edward held Parliament for many days at Berwick upon Tweed, where the nobles of Scotland and Galloway came to him, and he accepted their homage and alliance. So here we have the stone of Scone. Um, there it is. Uh, underneath here, the uh, throne in Westminster Abbey. And, of course, it's mentioned at the end of the play Macbeth by Shakespeare. That's how I was familiar with it. When they go on to um, get the victor, Malcolm, who's overcome Macbeth, to, to go and be confirmed at Scone. So the ceremony of coronation and anointing emphasised the divine and imperial attributes that made kings different from great lords, yet no king of Scotland was crowned and anointed until 1331. The coveted honour could be bestowed only by the papacy, which preferred not to antagonise the kings of England. So instead, largely pre-Christian rites were emphasised at the inauguration of a king of Scotland. At Scone, a sacred spot from early times, an ancient ceremony of enthronement and investure, the swearing of fealty, and the recitation of the king's genealogy was held. Um, the inauguration of kings of Scotland took place not in the Abbey of Scone, but actually on the mount outside it, the scone, um, stone of destiny, on which they were enthroned, was carried from the church uh, for the occasion. So, oh, what does it mention back here? It's an old Irish practice. There might have been uh, a mare killed and boiled up, and the king would eat its flesh and bathe in it, which is not done anymore, but that's kind of disgusting, isn't it? Um, the stone is said to have been born from Tara, the seat of the high kings of England, and was regarded with veneration. In 1296, Edward I went on a uh, relic collecting expedition to deprive the Scots of their regalia and spiritual treasures. His men removed what they believed to be the stone, taking it to Westminster Abbey, where it was put under the throne in which English monarchs are crowned. In return, uh, 
its return was an issue in Anglo-Scottish relations until well into the 14th century. However, in 1329, the papacy granted the privilege of coronation, which, you know, with all the ceremonial to the um, Scots, which meant that the, the stone became less and less vital. But I suppose a surefire way to frustrate and annoy a populace would be to take their relics and their spiritual livelihood, wouldn't it? The strategy that failed. Here we've got the empty plains near Berwick, which bears no apparent scars from the battle in 1296 pictured. Edward's army slaughtered most of the inhabitants of Berwick. And I guess here we have, um, on the left-hand side, a bit of a chronicle as to, as to the events here. So we've got that the... The English army um, mentions here about being in Flanders and being in, and then the English army is cut in two at the bridge, suffering a severe and costly defeat. So in that day's battle, the king's treasurer Hugh of Cressingham fell, killed by the Scottish spearmen. The man who had in the past slashed so many men with the sword of his tongue and his judgments was himself slain by the sword of the wicked. Scots flayed his body and divided the skin into tiny pieces, not for relics, but as an insult. I mean, that's a pretty big insult, if you ask me. And after this shocking start to the war, the Scots took courage and English hearts were plunged into confusion. The English soldiers who had remained in Berwick upon Tweed justly feared for their lives and abandoned the place so that the people had no leader or protector. When they invaded the town shortly afterwards, the Scots found it as empty as though it had been swept clean. The English kept possession of the castle, however, and fortified it. So, the attempts of Edward I and his son to gain control over Scotland gave rise to long and savage wars. The outcome turned to a great extent to the possession of Scotland's castles and fortified towns. At the outset of fighting in 1296, Edward's first action was to storm the inadequately defended border town of Berwick upon Tweed, slaughtering the inhabitants almost to a man. Less than six months later, after overrunning Scotland, he took care that all the country's fortresses should be stuffed with Englishmen by garrisoning vital strongholds like Edinburgh and Stirling. He could command the main routes throughout Scotland, but it became clear that this did not give him control over the whole nation. Instead, they generally occupied the castles while the Scots dominated the countryside between them. When the Scots temporarily gained the upper hand, as they did under William Wallace in 1297-8, they were unable to dislodge the invaders from their fortresses. When they managed to acquire a castle, they were rarely able to keep it. Edward's military expertise and superior financial resources enabled him to bring all the latest refinements of siegecraft into play. So, neither side was able to achieve final victory until a new Scottish leader, Robert Bruce, emerged in 1306, and with him a new war strategy. Abandoning conventional methods, they tried to starve the enemy out by applying a scorched earth policy, and made all out efforts to capture the English strongholds. Their weapons were the rope ladder and the cunning ruse, like the daring um, knight escalade of Edinburgh Castle Rock in 1314, or the farmer's cart used to jam open the doors of Linthicklo. Uh, when the fortresses were taken, they were systematically reduced to rubble for fear that, as Robert Bruce declared, the English afterwards might um, lord it over us by land by building our castles. 
So over here we have the art of weaving, essential to any household. Woolen cloth was needed by everyone and for every purpose, from coarse thick blankets that were used under saddles to sheer woolen cores for royal dresses and nightgowns. Carding, spinning and weaving were domestic skills before weaving became a uh, professional occupation. Many delightful illustrations indicate that these activities were lightened by the pleasures of companionship. Most show groups of women working together with the change in taxation, women became part of the trading chain, making cloth for sale. Weaving declined as an aristocratic household chore. And over here we have bales of wool shipped from inland pastures to towns and cities where merchants paid well for the best quality. Wool cloth became a stable product, more importantly perhaps than any other single commodity. The benefits of their wool trade brought to many communities that can be still seen in the richly endowed churches of East Anglia. As an interesting point actually, if you go and visit certain villages in England you may think that they're relatively small or isolated, but sometimes they've got these huge opulent churches. And actually, if you trace back their history you might find that they were built on some sort of wealthy trade. So wool accounted for half the wealth of England in the 13th century, as it already had done for at least two centuries. The stimulus for the wool trade came from Flanders, whose powerful counts had in the 11th century imposed a long period of peace on the region. With peace came prosperity and a rise in population. Food shortages resulted and many Flemings emigrated, often moving to the burgeoning Flemish cities where they worked in the region's rising industry, cloth manufacture. There were rival demands from the city-states of northern Italy and English wool production expanded to meet both markets. And as early as 1194, England grazed as much as 6 million sheep, producing up to 50,000 sacks of wool a year. Expansion continued throughout the 13th century and peaked during Edward I's reign when London was exporting 14,500 sacks a year. The fleeces were produced by two breeds of sheep, smaller upland animals, yielding a short, curly wool suitable for making high-class cloth, while the long, lank wool of lowland sheep was used for worsted and serge. The wolds and uplands of England were therefore valuable land by 1203. The monasteries of Markham and um, Clontarm in South Wales um, were prestigious and meticulous in the division of the pastorage rights. Now it's interesting because of Epping, where I live, is actually known originally as Epping in Norse in the Viking times, which actually translates to upland. So this area where I live must have been very wealthy back in the day. So the Clamorgan and Gwent uplands uh, were Cistercian houses, and the order had established itself in wastelands away from the wealth and temptation of the world. But by the 13th century, they were the very wastes were sources of wealth. So Sister Sea and Houses accounted for 66 of the 185 wool-producing monasteries listed in the 1290s by an Italian merchant, Francesco um, Balducci Pecolotti. Fountains in Yorkshire produced the most sacks, 74. The Welsh Sister Sea and Abbeys of Tintin and Thor sold their wool for the best price, 18 pounds, 13 shillings and 40 a sack. And the monks tended their flocks with the utmost care. Sheep were washed and clipped, treated with salves of tar and grease, and housed in clean, dry folds. Flocks infested with disease like the moraine, rot, and scab were uh, decimated during the, she uh, the sheep population in 1250 and were isolated. After shearing, which was women's work, the wool was delivered to contractors to be carded, baled, and packed before being carted to the ports. The aristocracy wasn't slow to exploit the lucrative trade. Barons invested heavily in their flocks. The Duchy of Lancaster controlled three great sheep ranches, two in Yorkshire, administered from the Duchy's office at Pontefract and Bickering, and another in Derbyshire's Peak District. The King's efforts to milk some of the profits of the wool trade anchored his noblemen and was politically dangerous. In the 1270s, England I had established a regular export duty, the great custom of 7 shillings 60 on a sack of wool. Between 1294 and 1297, when he tried to raise it to 40 shillings on every shack, uh, sack exported to help finance his war with France, England was brought to the brink of civil war. There were two reasons for this reaction. People feared that the king intended the new duty, known as the maltode, the unjust tax, to be permanent, that the export duty would be passed on to the 
producers by the exporters who had recovered their profits by offering them lower prices. The king had to back down, but his successors, particularly Edward III, continued to levy maltotes until bought off by Parliament in 1350. Royal interference on such a scale was the death of the Flemish trade. It forced prices up and drove the Flemish cloth manufacturers out of business, and in the end the industry moved to Brabant and Holland. England, um, under English entrepreneurs realised that the low price of wool um, meant that the cloth could be made much more cheaply than abroad. So the price of English um, cloth and the trade increased. So here we have crocards and pollards, a little bit of coinage. Bit of a chronicle here though. So we have um, on 28th of June the peace agreement between the kings of France and England that had not yet been completely settled was final, finalised by Pope. Boniface VIII in Rome, and in the same year, the supplication of Philip IV, King of France, Pope Boniface canonized the king's grandfather, Louis IX, on account of his resplendent miracles and outstanding merits. On the 31st of August, the St. Louis relics were translated at Saint Denis amid great festivity. And on the 30th of November, there were earth tremors at Rome that lasted for three days. Shortly afterwards, in England, there was one at dusk. A comet appeared in the north, giving out fiery beams to the east each evening after sunset for three days. That must have been so intense to have seen, mustn't it? We have here in 1299, Margaret, sister of Philip the Fair, King of France, set sail for Dover on the 8th of September, and with the Pope's blessing married Edward I, King of England, two days later at Canterbury. The King celebrated Christmas at Westminster, realised at the time that England was much corrupted by counterfeit coins called crockards and pollards. And on the 26th of December, King Edward I declared that they were to all be destroyed forever. At this, the son of a mason, thinking of his father's work, wrote the rhyme, By you our sterling is honourably maintained, Crocar put to flight, and copper left unstained. So I suppose that now brings us on to these, this coinage, and above here we have the silver penny and impostors. So we have the crocard um, and the pollard and the imitation sterling. So control of currency was a major problem, particularly as war demanded the movements of large sums of money to the continent. A penny would buy over eight loaves of bread or half a chicken, and the average daily wage for a labourer was a quarter of a d. Below here we have um, the groat um, and the farthing. A half penny. So the groat was valued at 40 and the farthing at a quarter of a d. So the kings of England controlled the manufacture and use of coins, silver pennies called sterling, since the Anglo Saxon times. And they therefore had the power to strengthen the silver content or occasionally debase it to make it a large number of coins and thus a quick profit for themselves. And between these three coinages, the stock deteriorated, it became worn, and the edges were clipped. The latter was a serious offence for which a number of people were hanged in 1278. The last three coinage before Edward I came to the throne had been in 1247, 25 years earlier, and the stock was in uh, poor condition at the start of the reign. By 1279 and 1281, about half a million pounds worth of pennies were called in and reminted, mostly at the mints in London and Canterbury. And new coins were introduced, the groat, which was worth 4D, and the half penny, and the farthing. The crown benefited financially, but not by debasing the coinage. Instead, it made a standard charge to cover costs, plus a further levy of silver as a profit of lordship. As a result of this re-coinage, nearly £20,000 borrowed from Italian merchants to finance the Welsh War of 1277 was repaid. Because English money was of good quality, it became profitable to bring slightly inferior foreign coin into England and uh, pass it off as English money. Similar in general appearance to 